Same word, three different things depending on the context. Word tenant, same thing. Can mean multiple things depending on the context. So when I say joint tenant with right of survivorship, I don't mean landlord tenant. I mean you both own it and the last person who's alive gets it. So in Washington, it's most common to be a, a tenant in common, which means you own 50%, I own 50%. If three of us own it, you own a third, I own a third, you own a third. If four of us own it, quarter, 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 quarter. And when we die, our estate, our estate says, who gets my quarter? I don't give away the whole thing, and you guys don't wind up with it. Now we've got to move my quarter to somebody else. So that's the deal with uh, community property. When husband and wife just buy it as husband and wife, it means tenants in common. What spouse one owns 50%, spouse two owns 50%. Spouse one dies. What are we, what are we doing with it? Now you can set up it. The, you could, you can buy the property as joint tenants with right of survivorship or tenants by the entirety. And then in that case, one spouse dies, other spouse gets it. You can have a bank account as joint tenants with right of survivorship, or tenants in common, and you can also have a bank account with a payable and death provision. One person dies, then after that person actually dies, then the money goes to the other person. So it's a multiple part answer, and it depends. <laughs> okay? Are you, so, are you sad you asked that question? Okay. Now, for your question, a Washington Trust that you set up here, or we set up for here, Mufti Suho, can own foreign bank accounts. It can own foreign real estate. Now, whether it's good enough in that particular country to satisfy their requirements, I don't know. If it's based on English law, because Washington law, you know, so a lot of, a lot of countries, you know, India, Pakistan, uh, a, a lot of, are based on English law, whether you like it or not, it just is. No, my so, question is not about the foreign law. My oh. question is what you have you are explaining here. You are explaining here. Yeah. This is the this should be the way of distribution of the wealth. Distribution, what, distribution yes, of wealth. Yes, you are explaining now. So this explanation, is it the restriction and limitation of the law in this country? Is the distribution of wealth? No, what you are explaining, that is the restriction and limitation of the law in this country. So what, what no. are you explaining? Is it by the law? By all this country? Yeah. But you are giving, is it your, your advice that this should be better way? Am I right? Easier way. In, uh, okay. Yeah, Easier okay. way. Yeah. But yeah. you know that it's not bound by the law. What you say is not bound by the law. Okay. But you are giving the a, a expert advice that this should be done. Am I right? No, because if you don't tell us, mm -hmm. What you want to do, the state of Washington will figure it out for you. It means, it means, it means, if I say to, in my will, that I want to give my property to everything to my wife, to call, the state will accept it. Am I right? So it's it, right. So it means, it means, the state will accept it if we can say in the will that I want to distribute my wealth after my uh, my death, as per the calculation attest here, so they will accept. Am I right? That's correct. That, that, oh, okay. That is correct. So that's why I have given the, the actually this, I am a lawyer in Dubai. Yeah. So we have a practice of distribution of wealth Islam, after the death of the Muslim. That's so right. we have practiced it. So we know that they have different type of distribution. And I have given the six popular calculation of distribution to, Ms., uh, to uh, Mr. Swell. Right. So maybe he will, he will, he will advise. Yeah. So, so you know. You know what has happened? Yeah. This booklet, this booklet, what has happened? That when we published the booklet about five years back, the, in London, they have given, they have made a bill. My distribution of wealth should be a, a test calculation of the booklet. So the they are doing it. Yeah. Is, is the freedom of prestation in the state? Yeah, there yeah. is freedom. So if freedom is freedom is for the law of the Quran. Yeah. If if you if you make a will and it's valid. Sure, we'll distribute it according yeah, to your yeah, will. Yeah. If you make a trust that's valid, we'll yeah. distribute it according to your trust. Yeah. If you do nothing, yeah. 
the state of uh, Washington. Yes, I know. Oh, goodness. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to figure out one way or another. Either you're going to tell us by a will and a probate, or we're going to do it, tell tell us through a trust, or the state of Washington is going to figure it out for you. And the problem is, and we'll, we'll get to this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The state of Washington distribution may not necessarily comply with Islamic law based on if your parents are alive, uh, your children, yeah, your siblings. Yeah. So the state of Washington might do something that's against Islamic law, not against Washington law, it's Washington law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the cool thing about a will or a trust is that you can make it comply with both. Okay? Yeah. All right. So. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned that debts must be paid first uh, before distribution of wealth. Correct. So how about the mortgage scenario? If there is a mortgage for a house, for example, <coughs> mortgage. Is, yeah, yeah. it's even <coughs> larger than the whole amount of the wealth. Yeah. What would be the situation then? Yeah. Okay, so what he's, he's asking, what I said was, when you do a probate, before you can make any distributions, you have to pay the debts. Mm -hmm. That's true. So well, what if I got a mortgage? And, it, and that mortgage complies with this law, well, I'm sure. <laughs> um, that's a different topic. No, no, no. In that situation, if you had the property in a trust, the trust can continue to service the debt and manage the debt, and manage the property. If it's in trust. If it's in a will through probate, and you leave it all to the spouse, the debt follows the title, and it's like, well, you didn't pay it all off, but you're on the hook anyway, so we let it slide. It's not a great way to live, but it usually works out. But if you have a trust, and that's what we've been doing for the past, well, since the mortgage meltdown, since 2008 and 9, right? Um, 8, 9, 10, 11, bad times for everybody. Uh, Real, we found out real estate market can go down, you can be unemployed, you know, a lot of bad things can happen. With a trust, what we've done, and this is the conversation I'd have with beneficiaries, is that mom and dad died, and the real estate market, it doesn't make any sense to sell the asset right now. So what we've been doing for the past seven years is saying, okay, it doesn't make any sense to sell the house, let's rent the house out. We'll distribute, we'll generate rental income, we'll take that money, we'll distribute it according to your trust, make the distributions every month or every quarter, and then we'll wait and see what happens. So with the probate, you're forced to open the probate, inventory the assets, and then get rid of the assets, either distribute them to an heir or sell them, and then close out the probate. A trust isn't that way. A trust is flexible. If it doesn't make sense to sell an asset now, well, we don't. We run it out. And that's what we've been doing to give the market a chance to recover. And so now I have people coming back you know, six, seven years later saying, okay, we're tired of being landlords. Let's go ahead, markets come back, let's sell it and close out the trust. It gives you that flexibility. Okay. Sir? What is the probate? What is the probate? The, the probate is, is what, what I said was that it's, it's no big deal. It's, you take title from the deceased person and you move it to living people. Simple concept. I want to go to the moon. Built in heritage. Ex execution is a little different. But is that different, different from will? Is probate no, it is a, a, a will goes through probate. inheritance. Yeah, so a will, the, the, the famous saying is a will speaks at the time of death. It's just a piece of paper. Even after you die, it's just a piece of paper. Until you take the piece of paper. <coughs> You guys need to, I mean, you got all these Microsoft guys who are super smart and they hooked up my Surface and all that. Buy a longer cord. I'm just saying. <laughs> Eight feet's not enough, man. You're going to have me back. I've got to have a headset or something going on. Um, so anyway, the will, this is your will, it means nothing until you die. Now you're dead. You die. It still means nothing until you file it with the court where you die. And then the court, the purpose of the court is called to prove the will. The court makes sure it's, a, it's an original signature, it has the right language, it's witnessed, it's notarized, and that the executor gets appointed, and then they say, okay, we will accept the will. This is good enough for us now. And you're appointed the executor, and here's an order. That's what probate is. Until that happens, then nobody has the authority to act. 
So you, the person actually has to die before you can file a probate? Correct. There's no provision to like file the will that you've come up with, with the court, and have it ready to be executed as soon as the person dies? Yeah, you can record anything. Yeah. Yeah, you, 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 can, you can write down on a piece of paper, you know, you know I'm the king of France, and record it. You didn't, you didn't get my question. So no, I got your question. So, so the point was, I mean, looks like from what you explained, that a will, even though you've come up with the document, yeah. and not be executed upon until it is filed with the court. That's step one. But And the filing of the court has to wait for the person to die. That's step two. Is that correct? Is yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, back in the 60s we and 70s. We executed after the date. That, you know, we didn't have, you know, like I got this cool document system that, you know, uh, she helped me set up. We got everything digital and we're all dialed in. It's awesome. Well, back in the 60s and 70s, it wasn't that way. We were tri you got to find a piece of paper. Right. So what lawyers told people was, look, dude, I, I don't know if I'm going to be around when you go and vice versa. So let's do the same thing. Let's take the piece of paper. Let's file it with the court. Okay. So they've got it. Okay. So that's it's, possible then? Yeah, possible. It doesn't do anything though. It's just, it's like a library. All you did was you took it and you gave it to the court doesn't mean anything. So what, what, what is the step remaining after you file it with the court, when you're alive? Oh, while you're alive? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. You got it out. So, <laughs> <laughs> the point is, I'm trying to see if there is a way to reduce the waiting period. You said it'll take a part. There's no way to reduce the waiting There's period. There's no problem. Okay. Because that's four months after you die. Okay. All right, fine. So you got it out. <laughs> Tough story. See, it is, it is simple. Will can be. We have something called joint ownership in the Sharia. Um, so a person usually the scenario is that somebody purchases a house. He has a joint account. He's married, and now the mortgage is uh, is taken out as well. And Esther said that's something that needs to be discussed whether it's uh, Sharia compliant or not. The thing is, who actually owns the house, right? Although in title, it might be reflecting that the husband and the wife are co-owners of the house. Um, but in reality, in Sharia, who actually paid for that house? That is going to be the owner, right? Unless now that has been gifted to the wife or there has been some agreement between husband and wife that I've gifted you half the house or you are now the owner of half the house. Um, <clears throat> then the other issue comes about that now who is responsible for the paying off of the debts? Right? Assuming the person passes away, fine, you give 50% you give of the house to his wife. Is she responsible now to bear the, the loan or to bear the expenses and to service that, that loan? So uh, these are certain aspects of Sharia that we need to be aware of. And although in title it might reflect something, but the reality is that in the Sharia, who purchased the property, by default that will be established as the owner. If he gave 50% or whatever percent he wished to his wife, then she will be the owner of that. Otherwise, by default, he will remain the owner. Um, you know, you have the common question or the common argument that, you know, this is something which is set in title and this is the oath or it is the understood practice in society. Um, the reality is not that. When there's a divorce or when somebody passes away and it comes to the crunch time and somebody has to want the surviving spouse or the other spouse has to claim, then quickly the Sharia law comes into place that no, by Sharia I'm the owner and I should have the house. Uh, or by Sharia, he's, he was the owner of the house, so he has to pay it, I'm, I'm not going to pay anything. So we have to be honest with ourselves as well and uh, understand that in Sharia, although something might be on title legally uh, or in a formal way, but the reality is that who purchased the property or who it was gifted to, they are the actual owners. Um, yes, we have to take steps now to make sure that it is uh, it's compliant legally, uh, whereby if we want to gift the house to the wife or we want it to have 50% ownership, we gift it to her in her lifetime, or in our lifetime, rather. We say that we uh, make it a formal agreement that this year, which can be recorded also in the trust that uh, this has, or whichever attorney you go to, they can include it there, that this particular property, it is in by title, 
uh, under the ownership of myself and my wife, and also according to Islamic law, I have formally gifted it to her. Yeah, uh, that's right. Um, no, it's, that's right. And the other cool thing about what we've done with the estate plan is that if there is a dispute, we've provided a, a mechanism for everybody to be able to, to select their own mufti for the interpretation and then for them to resolve it. So it avoids lawyers, it avoids the legal app, the, it avoids the legal problem. Okay. Any other questions on this on this topic of probate court? Yeah. How about the probating the will? Now that would be multiple verses for the will, person one, person two, yeah. person three. Now does the court wait for the all the persons to appear, or does or does it uh, does the court, Washington law will execute whatever will has come and wait for a certain time? Or how do you resolve this matter? Yeah. So. Number one, it doesn't come up that often, but it does come up. And so the, the deal is, whoever files the will, whichever will it is, the court accepts it if it complies with you know, the witness requirements and original all that. You then publish notice in the paper, and then you send notice of all the documents to all the known beneficiaries. And if anybody else has a competing will, they can then file it, and then the court can decide which will is correct. Yeah. It doesn't happen that often, but it does come up. It's not, you know, unusual, but it does come up. Okay. Any questions? Any more? And we'll come back to this at the end. But any questions now about about probate or wills? No. Okay. So the best solution is a revocable trust. And what this is, it's a contract that you make with yourself, where you are the the creator of the trust. You're the tr trustor. You also act as the, like the president of the corporation, you're the trustee, and you're also the beneficiary, the person entitled to receive gifts or distributions. So you're all three. And so if you're a single person, you're all three by yourself. If you're a married couple, then you can be all three at the same time. Or one person would be the trustee, and the other person not be a trustee. It's, a, it's an election of which way you want to go. Okay. So the advantages of a trust are as follows, and this may not be extensive, but this is kind of a laundry list of it. Number one, it's effective that immediately the day you sign it. You don't have to die. You come in, we get it done, you sign it, it's effective right then. Right then. Okay. It's, in the event of incapacity, you have somebody in place who is able to manage your assets right away. You don't have to hire a lawyer, you don't have to file anything with a court, Right? It automatically happens. So if, and this is an issue that we see all the time, is that is that somebody has a bank account that where they've been writing the checks and if I have, you know, I'm married, I have a separate bank account from my wife, right? She doesn't have access to my account while I'm alive. But if I become incapacitated at that moment in time, my family can access my bank account and then pay for my care or, or my bills or what it is that they need to do. While I'm alive, they can't. But if I'm alive and become incapacitated, then they have access, and that's what a trust does for you as well. There's no delay, and there's no cost for that either. A trust is private. Okay. Whatever assets you put in there, that's up to you. If you are to pass, we don't have to file it with the court. We don't have to file an inventory and tell them, what real estate you own, or cars, or bank accounts, or how much is in your bank account, or what creditors you owe. We don't tell anybody. It's private. It provides for continuity of management. Uh, a revocable living trust, it's cost effective in the long run. And the reason is, you set it up now. Now, you may not pass 30, 40, 50, 60 years. I don't know. You know, medicine's amazing. People are living a lot longer. But what you do if, you're, if you are married, you actually avoid two probates instead of one because if spouse one dies, you've got to do a probate, and spouse two dies, you've got to do two probates. With a trust, there's no probate whatsoever. So if you're married, you avoid two probates, not just one. If you're single, you obviously avoid one probate. Um, uh, trusts are very difficult to contest, which he was kind of bringing up. He was talking about, hey, if I make a trust or I make a will, and it's accepted, is that what we do? Is that the distributions that happen? And the answer is yes. They're very difficult to contest. 
And like I said, working with the guidance of Mufti Suhail, the trust that we've created, so it's very unique in that we put in a dispute resolution. If any of your heirs have a dispute, we've put in a provision that you can contact Mufti Suhail or any, any Mufti you want to resolve the dispute. And then that resolution is then binding. So no, you know, if you die in Washington, you don't involve the Washington courts. If you're in a different state, it doesn't involve a different state. If you're in a different country, it doesn't involve a different country. So it provides that mechanism as well. Uh, it's, it also pre prohibits, uh, prevents the unintentional dis disinheriting along with other problems, joint ownership. So when, was it asking about joint ownership? You? Yeah. So when you're asking, hey, we could have a bank account together, okay? Well, say it's you and your wife and you have a bank account together and you don't have children, okay? And you die. Well, under Islamic law, certain things are supposed to happen. Distributions, right? Or if you do have children, there's still Islamic law provisions regarding that as well. Uh, if you own it together and there's a common death, or if you're a single person and there's a death, then that distribution may not happen. A distribution will happen. It may be not what you wanted or what complies with this law. Okay. Um, if you own property in a different state, it eliminates the need for a probate in another state as well. So it's very, pop it's, it's very important if you own real estate in Washington and you own real estate in any other state that you have a trust. Because if you were to pass, then you have to do a probate in each state where you own real estate. And this comes back to the topic of, well, what if I have real estate in another country? A Washington trust can own foreign property. You still have to file your, your disclosures, just like we, we'll talk about that a little, a little bit later in the program. You still got to file your disclosures like you, you did anyway. If the trust is good enough in your country, that's a different question. And I know if it's based on English law, then the trust that we've developed is good enough. But I also defer to the local attorney. You know, if you're from Dubai, I would, def I would defer to a Dubai attorney. Okay. Um, it allows for post-mortem tax estate planning. Well, what does that mean? It means, well, in Washington, we have a Washington State inheritance tax, and it's $2 million per person and it is a use it or lose it exemption. So, if you're a married couple and you do things the right way, you can pass up to $4 million to your children or your heirs tax free, no inheritance tax. And the inheritance tax in Washington is pretty steep. It starts off at $320,000 if you, if you don't comply with the rule. And for a lot of people, when you're at that four plus million, it's $560,000 plus 16%. So it can, the price tag can get pretty hefty pretty fast, but it allows for post-mortem tax estate planning. What does that mean? It means when you pass, we don't have to have a crystal ball now and know when we're going to die or what the tax code's going to be. It allows flexibility for your trustee to manage your assets to avoid as much tax as possible. That's the idea. Okay. All right. Um, step up in tax basis for real estate. What this means is this avoids capital gains. So if you, if I'll use the example of uh, a married couple with children. If you're a married couple with children and you own real estate and one spouse dies, the value of all assets are stepped up to the value date of death. So if you bought the house for hundred thousand dollars, you can still get a good house around here for hundred grand, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and you sold it for seven hundred thousand Capital gains is the difference in between what you bought it for and what, it's, what you sold it for. So $600,000 and you paid capital gains on that, right? Well, when you leave it through to your heirs, through a trust or through probate, you can get this through probate as well, then the value is stepped up to value date of death. So the heirs can then sell the assets and pay zero capital gains. Okay. So, and it applies to stock as well. So if you have vested stock where you got it cheap, I'm sure nobody in here has any Microsoft stock, but if you do, <laughs> might apply to you. Where you got it kind of cheap and you were to pass, the value is stepped up to value date of death. So it, it doesn't mean you have to sell all the stock. It doesn't mean you, you, you have to do anything. It just means the value is stepped up to value date of death. So if you decided to sell some stock, you pay zero capital gains. 
Now you can get that through propane as well, but you've got to die and you've got to hire a lawyer and all that stuff. But the trust, if the accounts are owned by the trust, you get the step up in tax basis without the administrative expenses. And then um, you can change your mind and make amendments. I mean, it happens. I've got three kids. You know? my, main, <laughs> my mind of them has changed a lot in the past 25 years, right? Uh, it continues to change. Well, the cool thing about a trust is you can change your mind. If you want your kids to have everything when you're 18, you know, chic son, 17, you know, that guy, he likes Ferraris and stuff, you know, she passes, goes to heaven, you know, he, he, if he gets all the money, a uh, kid can do what he wants with it. But what if you pick the age 24, or 25, or 35, or 40, or whatever? That's the cool thing about a trust. You can pick different ages. Now, you can do that through probate. You could put, you could put in your will that if I die and my child's less than 25 years old, then the property is held in trust for their benefit until they turn 25? Well, that's, that's backwards, man. You could do that right Absolutely. now. Why, why put it in a paper where you've got to die and hire a lawyer and then do it? Yeah. I'm going to do this probably quite often. No. So that I don't lose the train of thought, right? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so bear with me. Sure. All right, so just on the point of, you can come back to that point. Yeah. Alright, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me now? Alright, so with regards to the uh, comment that was made, when to release funds to the heirs, right, especially children. So, as far as Islamic law is concerned, when a person passes away, then of course no ownership transfers to his heirs. Um, when children are very minor or they're young, then of course somebody has to take, or the guardian will have to take, uh, care of those funds and ensure that it is spent on them. And the Quran speaks about this as well that when it should be released to them. That when you sense that they have some maturity with regards to their financial dealings, then you release their funds to them. Right? So that is the time when the funds have to be released to them. So to set an age of 18 or 21 or 25 or 30, this will be uh, something which is uh, subjective, depending on the maturity of the child. So some people mature financially when they are 18. Sometimes when they are 15, they mature financially. It does not, so it's not based on the age of guru as well. So when we talk about maturity as far as uh, inheritance is concerned, it's not referring to when they are mature in the physical sense. It's when they are mature in the mental sense. Um, so to, to restrict it to some particular age uh, is not the best thing to do. It will be something that I would say that, uh, you know, as far as the trustee is concerned or will, we would normally advise that it should be uh, left to the discretion of uh, the attorney or panel of people who would be able to assess the situation, a panel of executives who would be able to assess the situation. And if they feel that the child is now uh, financially mature, then it should be released to them. Some scholars, Islamic scholars, like uh, especially the Jumeirah and Tulalama in the Transvaal, Johannesburg region, region uh, which Dr. Hashim, Hashim Chotia is a big fan of. So, so they have the. Um, they have, in their worlds, they've included the age 25, and they've kept this as this is a, a safe age for funds to be released to the children. So, going on the opinion of these scholars, it will be permissible to restrict it to the age of 25. But, you know, um, those ulama that, uh, there are those ulama that feel, or those scholars that feel that it should be left open. It should be left now to a panel of, of executors or mature people to determine now whether the child has reached that age or not where he deserves the funds. Um, so, sometimes that might be difficult to achieve especially in this country. Sure. Can you hold it a little closer? Uh, the people in the back are not even oh, here. Okay. Sorry about that. So if we can, uh, so th that is one thing I will work with Chris on, with regards to the age of maturity, with regards to when these funds uh, should be released to the child. So this is something which is subjective and something that we should keep in mind as well.
uh, question on that. So is the age only qualifier you can put in, or what if you want to put, let's say, the child has to finish college before you can access yeah. the money? Yeah, that what is the maturity age here in, in the uh, this state? Okay. I'll take both questions. So the deal is, you got to hang a number on it. Uh, and, and that's where you have to use the guidance of the Mufti regarding your particular family. We have to provide, if you, if you provide no age, it's 18. A commonly accepted age is 21. A lot of people do age 25. Sometimes they break, you break it out further, but we can't leave it open-ended, except in the case of a special needs child. If you have somebody who received government assistance because of some disability, then you can place the assets in a special needs trust where it's managed solely at the discretion of the trustee for that child's lifetime. Now, the money can be used for whatever purpose, education or, or, or whatever, uh, food, housing, trips, whatever it is, but they never get a check. You can pay other people, they never get a check. <coughs> used to, we used to put all sorts of stuff in, in trust and say, well, you know, uh, they get the money as long as they have a C average in college. Right? Well, shoot, man, internet, hear of it? You can be enrolled in a college in 15 minutes, all right? So that's out the window. We, I, I like, like to say I haven't drafted them, but I have. I mean, we've done it where, well, I'm going to leave money to child as long as the child is no longer to married to this person. <laughs> I've written that stuff down. <laughs> it's, but it's not enforceable. So age, age is the only thing. That you, likewise, you can't say it the other way. You, you can't, you can't say I leave this gift, whatever it is, a, a percentage or a fraction, whatever, to them if they get married. You can't make them get married, and you can't make them get divorced. You also can't make them have children. So you can write that down, but it's not enforceable. Did that answer your question? It's, it's a great idea. It's just there's so many ways around.